time that we now celebrate as Christmas. It all started with one ultimate gift that now down through the centuries has developed into nationwide gift giving, all because of Jesus Christ. And our culture tries to deny Christ, tries to push that out of culture, tries to push that out of everything, that religion doesn't matter, that Christianity doesn't matter. But even down in the basic roots of the holiday Christmas, it all started because Christ gave himself. God sent Christ and gave him to us. But as I said, we know the gift of salvation, but I wanted to look at three gifts that could fall under that. And the first one I want to look at is actually third on my list. I rearranged that. Um, but an everlasting future. As I just read John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So the first gift that God gives us when he saves us from our sins is not only taking our sins away from us, but he gives us everlasting life. And there's three things that I want to look at under that, and we can turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, and then also turn to Revelation chapter 20. But in Romans 6, it says, For the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And then over to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 15. It says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Okay, so now this is speaking the book of life. It's the book that God has in heaven that all those who believe on him All those who ask Christ to forgive them of their sins, our names are in the book of life. But if your name is not in that book of life, then the Bible is saying here, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So the first thing I want us to see in this everlasting future that we have that God has given us is that our future is not in hell. And we can praise God for that because hell was a place that God set apart for the devil and his demons. Sadly, because of the fall of man, man is condemned there also, but God gave his son to save us from that. But not only does it get better, God could leave it there with saying, okay, you asked me to forgive you, so I won't send you to hell, and therefore we're free of the punishment. But it gets better than that. Our everlasting future is then spent with God. And we can turn to John 14. John 14, verses 1 through 3, we see that our future in heaven, our everlasting future, is with God. It says, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come, my, come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. So here we see that we get to spend our future with God, that Christ said, if you believe in me, I'm going to come back and I'm going to take you home to be with me forever. And that's something that we don't deserve. Nothing in us deserves having a future with Christ. We're sinners by nature. All of us, we're also sinners by choice. We make choices every day. It seems like all the time I'm faced with, Ryan, why did you choose to do that? Why did you choose to think that? Why did you say that? And I choose to sin. We all choose to sin, yet Christ still forgives us and still gives us an eternity with him. But lastly, under the everlasting future, I see that we have undeserved blessings in that future. It says here, well, in John chapter 14, it says that Jesus is going home to be with his Father, to prepare a place for us. And we can turn to Revelations chapter 21 and chapter 22. And I'm not going to take the time to read all that, but we'll start reading verse 21, verse 1, in chapter 21, verse 1. It says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And the rest of the book of Revelation goes on and it describes the beauty that Christ has prepared for us in heaven, something that we don't deserve. It talks about mansions. It talks about gates 
it talks about walls crusted in gems, golden streets, a sea of crystal. I mean, stuff that we can't even begin to comprehend here on earth. We have golden rings, silver rings. We have diamonds. We have other precious gems. But they are so minuscule and insignificant compared to what God has prepared for us. You know, all of us, we don't deserve that. I definitely don't deserve that. But Jesus has prepared this undeserved blessing for us. Not only do we not go to hell like we deserve, not only do we get to spend an eternity with God, our Creator, but He's created the most beautiful place on earth for us to, not on earth, uh, in this realm that He's created for us to spend that eternity in. Something that, that we don't deserve, and that's because Christ came and died for us. But then I want to look at something else that we've received as a gift from God because of our salvation, because of trusting Him, because Christ came and died for us, and that's the Holy Spirit. Turn with me to Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, and we'll look at verse 38. Acts 2, 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So here we see in Acts, as Peter is teaching to these unsaved individuals, he's telling them that if you repent and believe on Christ, then you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now what does that gift include? Well, as I thought about, the, we can break down the gift of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, into so many things. But I broke it down into two things that kind of cover the majority of them. First thing that I see is that the Holy Spirit is a comforter. And we can turn to John chapter 14 and look at verse 26. John 14, 26. You can see that there. And it says, and, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Now, as I was studying the word Comforter, I was looking at the Greek word, which is something that I struggled through in college learning Greek, but I have this awesome program on my computer that breaks everything down for me. And the word there is parakletos that the Holy Ghost is our paraclete. We get, derive the word paralegal from it in our present day English, but it ultimately, in basic form, it means to call to one's aid. And that's what the Holy Spirit is, is our comforter. He's called to our aid. He's with us to aid us in whatever we need, whether we're going through a sorrowful time where we need comforting, knowing that he's with us, or whether we're struggling to understand with something, Christ is there to be with us, to be an aid to us, to help us. And according to John 14, 26, which we read here, it says, He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So as we study the word of God, if you have a mind like mine, things go in it, you think, okay, I got that, and then it disappears. Well, John's saying here is that the Holy Ghost is being sent unto us so that the things that he's taught us, the things that we've learned, he'll bring that back to our memory when we need it. But then the second thing I want to look about the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, is that he's a witness. And let's turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 and see that there, that he's our witness. Hebrews 10, verse 15, it says, Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before. And so just like I took the word comforter and I looked at that in the Greek, I wanted to see what witness was. And the word was martyreo, which we derive martyr from. And as we think of, I've, well, my father has read in the past to us, Fox's Book of Martyrs, a thick book about men of the faith, women of the faith, who have died preaching the gospel of Christ, who have died for their faith. 
they were witnesses of something that they've experienced, something that they look forward to because of the word of God, and they've died for it. But the word witness also comes from that. And it's speaking that, the, and this verse here is telling us that the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, is our witness as we go through our life, that he's with us. He, being the Holy Spirit, being God, being equal to God, he knows what's in our future. He, he sees what God has planned for us, sees the plans for us. And as we seek God's will, the Holy Spirit will slowly develop that for us, and he can affirm our direction. As we, as we seek God's will. And, and these are just two of, two of the ways that the Holy Spirit ministers to us. The Holy Spirit is with us that I see in the book, see in the Bible. But so that's the second gift we have from God. We have an everlasting future with God. And we have the Holy Spirit from God. But lastly, I want to see we have a new life in Christ. And we can turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 for that. A new life in Christ. And we'll look at verse 17. Verse that I think we're all familiar with in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And I have here written in my notes that Everything is dramatically changed. Everything. Not one detail is left unchanged because of this. And I meditated on that for a while, and it got me thinking. And as all of you know, I'm recently married, and I knew that some changes would be involved there as I got married and started a new life with Hannah. But one, I did not realize how dramatically being married would change me. It changes with the government, the amount of paperwork to fill out, get sent out, get sent back, refill out, send to different departments, a lot of paperwork involved. And then changes in family, more family members to buy Christmas presents for, and change in friends. I have to hang out with Hannah's friends. She has to hang out with my friends. And then the changes just to us individually. There's a lot of changes in being married, I found out. But being changed in Christ is so much greater than that. It says in here, old things are passed away. Old things are dead, gone. They're stuck here, and as we move forward in life, we just keep getting farther away from those old things. Never should we cross back with them. But as I was looking at that, I was thinking of the hundreds of examples that were before me of changed lives that we had. So I have a few here that I want to go through and just how God, Christ, changes lives and how great that is, that gift of God that we have a changed life. I think of Peter. He was a fisherman. He was basically a nobody back in, back in the Bible times, back in the early century. But his life was changed. He went from being a lowly fisherman who spent his days on the beach, on the boat, mending nets, playing with stinky fish, to being a great disciple of Jesus Christ, one who roamed the Middle East with Christ, learning everything he can from him. Now, sometimes Peter's made mistakes, he denied Christ, but ultimately the changes that were made in Peter as he matured in Christ were so significant. Nothing from his past was in his future. He left that behind. He left his fishing nets. He left his boat when he followed Christ. And that's how our lives need to be. We have the opportunity in Christ to leave the old behind, leave our sin behind, leave our past behind, and to start afresh, all because Christ died for us. But then I thought of Paul he, he killed Christians before he was saved. He hunted them down. He drugged them out of their homes and off to jail and, and killed them. We think of Stephen, whom he killed. But Paul, his life was dramatically changed on the road to Damascus, and he became a great apostle of Jesus Christ, wrote many of the books in the New Testament, all because Christ changed his life, and he left his past behind. He didn't dwell on his past, what happened there, but he put that away and he moved on knowing that Christ has forgotten that, knowing that God has put that away. So he 
dwelled in the changed life, not in his past. And then I thought more present, well, not quite present day, but come back a few centuries ago to John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace. Well, before John Newton was saved, he was a soldier. He was kidnapped by the English Navy, and they press-ganged him into service there. And while he was in service, he ran away. He said, the Navy's not for me, and he tried to run away. But he got caught, and he ended up a slave. And then he went from being a slave to being a slave trader, trading slaves, bringing them from Africa to England, and all that. Then one day, God got a hold of him and changed his life. And the change was so great that he penned the song Amazing Grace, a song that's sung all over the world. And just to show how great that God changes his life, changed his life. And that's the same for all of us today. God didn't just work in the past. He didn't just change Peter's life. He didn't just change Paul's life. He didn't just change John Newton's life. He changed all of our lives. We all have the same opportunity that these men have. We all can live for God the way they did. We all can leave our past and our sin. And, you know, I'm, I'm preaching to myself when this message came to me, I was like, wow, this message hits me hard. There, it, it was a difficult message, especially when I got down to the conclusion. But all of us can live victorious Christian lives. All of us can. All of us can live this gift from God, this new life, because Christ has changed our life. But then, this Christmas season, we, as we give gifts, I'm excited about giving gifts. I think I've got some good gifts to give, and I'm excited about receiving gifts. But God gave the ultimate gift. He gave his son. And this time of year, as we think about giving gifts, it's one of the few times of year that people go to, that unsaved people go to church. They go to church Christmas and Easter because they feel like that's the right thing to do. They're open to the gospel that time of year. And you know, for us as Christians, that's an open door for us. And this is, this is where the message hit home in my heart. As I thought about this, God really spoke to me that I need to be a better witness. You might be sitting there thinking, well, You've gone to Bible college. Isn't that supposed to come naturally to you? Well, not really. It's still just as difficult for me as it was before I went to college. But God's been working in my heart that I need to be a better witness for him, that there's people that I know that are very close to my heart that I need to witness to. And I'm sure all of you out there today have someone, if not a family member or friend, who's close to your heart that you can share the gospel with. And... That's what struck me. We have all these gifts from God. Not only do we have salvation and forgiveness of sins, but we have an everlasting future in a beautiful place called heaven. We have the Holy Spirit with us to comfort us, to aid us as we go through life. And we have a new life, a life that's completely changed from what it was. And you know, that gift just wasn't given to us. As we read in John 3.16, it said, For God so loved the world. That's all of us, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And you know, it is our responsibility as Christians to pass that good news, pass that gospel, pass the gift of God on to others, just like someone passed that on to us. And this Christmas season, I know I want to be a better witness. I know there's people I want to talk to and make a point to talk to, and I'm sure all of you know people that you should. But just as we give gifts, it's fun to give Christmas gifts. I'm looking forward to it. But God really burdened me about sharing the ultimate gift, his son, which came to us. Let's close in prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you for this evening. I thank you for working in my heart through this message, Lord, and burdening